The Excursion by Edwina Stanton Babcock Mrs. Tuttle arrived breathless, bearing a large gilt parrot cage. She swept up the gangway of the fall of Rome and was enthusiastically received. There were, however, concealed titterings and suppressed whispers. My sake, she went and brought that bird. I won't believe it till I see it. There he sets in his gold coop. Mrs. Tuttle brought Romeo to the excursion with the same assurance that a woman of another stamp brings her Pekingese dog to a restaurant table. While the fall of Rome sounded a warning whistle and hawsers were loosed, she adjusted her veil and took cognizance of fellow passengers. In spite of wealth and owning her own automobile, Mrs. Tuttle's fetish was democratic popularity. She greeted one after another. "'How do, Mrs. Bridge and Mr. Two? Who's keeping store while you're away?' "'Carrie Turpin, you hear? Where, sir? Couldn't come? Now that's too bad.' After a long stare, "'You're some fleshier, ain't you, Carrie?' A large woman in a tan-colored linen duster came slowly down the deck, a camp stool in either hand. Her portly advance was intercepted by Mrs. Tuttle. Mrs. Tenere, same as ever. Mrs. Tenere dropped the camp stools and adjusted her smoked glasses. She gave a start and the two ladies embraced. Mrs. Tuttle said that it beat all, and Mrs. Tenere said she never. Mrs. Tuttle emerged from the embrace, readjusting her hat with some ringed fingers, inquiring, "'How's the folks?' Up lumbered Mr. Tenere, a large man with a chuckle and pale eyes, who was introduced by the well-known formula, "'Mrs. Tuttle, Mr. Tenere, Mr. Tenere, Mrs. Tuttle.' The Tenere said, "'So you brought the bird along, hey?' Then, without warning, all conversation ceased. The fall of Rome, steaming slowly away from the pier, whistled a sodden whistle, the flags flapped, and everyone realized that the excursion had really begun. This excursion was one of the frank displays of human hopes, yearnings, and vanities that sometimes take place on steamboats. Feathers had a hectic brilliancy that proved secret dumb longings. Pendants known as lavaliers hung from necks otherwise innocent of the costly fopperies of Versailles. Old ladies clad in princess dresses, with yachting caps worn rakishly on their gray hair, vied with other old ladies in automobile bonnets, who, with opera glasses, searched out the meaning of every passing bowie. Young girls carrying mesh bags, that subtle connotation of the feminine character, extracted toothpicks from them or searched for bits of chewing gum among their over-scented treasures. As it was an excursion, the fall of Rome carried a band and booths laden with many delicious superfluities such as popcorn and the misleading compound known as saltwater taffy. There were, besides, the blue and red pendants that always go on excursions, and the yellow and pink fly flappers that always come home from them. Also, there were stacks of whistle whips and slender canes with ivory heads with little holes pierced through. These canes were bought only by cynical young men whose new straw hats were fastened to their persons by thin black strings. Each young man, after purchasing an ivory-headed cane, retired to privacy to squint through it undisturbed. Emerging from this privacy, the young man would then confer with other young men. What these joyless young men saw when they squinted they never revealed but among their elders they spread the strong impression that it was the capital of Washington, or Bunker Hill Monument. Besides bottled soda and all soft drinks, the fall of Rome carried other stimuli in the shape of comic gentlemen, such beings as, more or less depressed in their own proper environment, on excursion suddenly see themselves in their true light, irresistibly fastidious. These funny gentlemen, mostly husbands, seated themselves near to large groups of indulgent women and kept up an exquisite banter directed at each other's personal defects, or upon the idiosyncrasies of any bachelor or spinster near. These funny gentlemen kept alluding to the excursion as the exertion. If the boat rolled a little, they said, "'Now, mother, don't rock the boat. Here, girls, sit up close. We'll all go down together.' Hold on to your bew, Minnie. He'll fall overboard and where you'll get another one. The peals of laughter at these sallies were unfailing. The crunch of peanuts was unfailing. The band, with a sort of plethoric indulgence, played slow waltzes in which the bass instruments frequently misapplied notes, but to the allure of which came youthful dancers lovely in proud awkward poses. Mrs. Tuttle, meanwhile, was the social center, demonstrating that mysterious psychic force known as being the life of the party.
she advanced upon a tall, sallow woman in mourning, challenging, "'Now, Mrs. Mealer, why don't you just set and take a little comfort? It won't cost you nothing. Ain't that your girl over there by the coffee fountain? I should have known her by the resemblance to you. She real refined looking.' Mrs. Mealer, a tall, sallow widow with carefully maintained mourning visage, admitted that this was so. Refinement, she averred, was in the family, but she hinted at some obscure ailment which, while it made Emma refined, made her miserable. "'I brought her along,' sighed Mrs. Mealer, "'taint as if neither of us could take much pleasure into it, both of us being so deep and black for her pauper, but the styles is bound to do her good. Emma is such a great hand for style.' Yes, replied Mrs. Tuttle blandly. This lady in blue was not nearly so interested in Emma as in keeping a circle of admirers hanging around her cerulean presence, but even slightly encouraged Mrs. Mealer warmed to her topic. Style, she replied impressively. Style seems like Emma couldn't never have enough of it. Where she got it, I don't know. I wasn't never much for dress, and give her pauper coat and pants, twas all he wanted. But Emma... If you want to make her happy, tie a bow on to something. Mrs. Tuttle nodded in ostentatious understanding. Rising, she seized Romeo's cage and placed it more conspicuously near her. She was critically watched by the older women. They viewed the thing with mingled feelings, one or two going so far as to murmur darkly, her and her parrot. Still, the lady's elegance and known fact that she owned and operated her own automobile cast a spell over most of her observers, and many faces, as Mrs. Tuttle proceeded to draw out her pet, were screwed into watchful and ingratiating benevolence. Romeo, a blasé bird with the air of having bitter memories, affected for a long time not to hear his mistress's blandishments. After looking contemptuously into his seed cup, he crept slowly around the side of his cage, fixing a cynical eye upon all observers. "'How goes it, Romeo?' appealed Mrs. Tuttle. Making sounds supposed to be appreciated by birds, the lady put her feathered head down, suggesting, "'Ah, there, Romeo.' "'Rubberneck,' returned Romeo sullenly. To show general scorn, the bird revolved on one claw round and round his swing. He looked dangerous, repeating, Rubberneck. At this, an interested group gathered around Mrs. Tuttle, who, affable and indulgent, attempted by coaxings and flirtings of a fat, bediamonded finger to show Romeo off, but the pampered bird saw further opportunity to offend. Rubberneck, screamed Romeo again. He ruffled up his neck feathers, repeating, Rubberneck, I'm cold as the deuce. What's the matter with Hannah? Let them all go to grass. Several of the youths with ivory-headed canes now forsook their contemplations to draw near, grinning to the parrot cage. Stimulated by these youths, Romeo reeled off a more ribald remarks, things that created a sudden chill among the passengers on the fall of Rome. Mrs. Tenere, looked upon as a leader, caught up a shocked face and walked away. Mrs. Mealer, after a faint, excuse me, also abandoned the parrot cage, and Mrs. Bean, a small stout woman with a brown false front, followed the large lady with blue spectacles and the tan linen duster. On some mysterious pretext of washing their hands, these two left the upper deck and sought the calm of the white and gold passenger salon. Here they trod as in the very sanctities of luxury. These carpets is nice, ain't they? remarked Mrs. Bean. Then alluding to the scene they had just left, "'Ain't it comical how she idolizes that there bird?' Mrs. Tenere sniffed. "'And what she spends on him. Initials on his seed cup. And some says the cage itself is true gold.' Mrs. Bean, preparing to wash her hands, removed her black skirt and pinned a towel round her waist. "'This here liquid soap is nice,' turning the faucets gingerly. "'And don't the boats set good onto the water?' Then returning to the rich topic of Mrs. Tuttle and her pampered bird— Where'd she get all her money for her automobile and her gold cage? Mrs. Tenere at an adjacent basin raised her head sharply. You ain't heard about the Tuttle money. You don't know how Mabel Hutch that was was heir to everything. Mrs. Bean confessed that she had not heard, but she made it evident that she thirsted for information. So the two ladies, exchanging remarks about sunburn and freckles, finished their hand washing and proceeded to the dark green plush seats of the salon where, with appropriate looks of horror and incredulity, Mrs. Bean listened to the story of the heirs of the Hutch's money. Mabel was the favorite. Her pa set great store for her. There was another sister, consumpted. She should have been the heir, but she died. 
Then the youngest, Hetty, she married my second cousin, Hen Crony. Well, it seemed like they hadn't nothing but bad luck, and her pa and Mabel sort of took against Hetty. Mrs. Bean, herself chewing calculatingly, handed Mrs. Tenneray a bit of sugared calamus root. Is your cousin Hen dark complexioned like your folks? she asked scientifically. Mrs. Tenneray, narrowing both eyes, considered. More Auburn inclined, I should say. He ain't real smart, Hen ain't. He gets took with spells now and then. But I never held that against him. Uh-huh, agreed Mrs. Bean sympathetically. Well, then, Mabel Hutch and her pauper took against poor little Hetty. Old man Hutch, he died and left everything to Mabel, and she never goes near her own sister. Mrs. Bean raised gray cotton gloved hands, signifying horror. St, 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 she deplored. She searched in a reticule for more calamus root. He didn't leave her nothing? No, ma'am, this one. With a jerk of her head, Mrs. Tenere indicated a dashing blue feather seen through a distant salon window. This one's got it all, heir to everything. And what did she do? Married a traveling salesman and built a tony brick house. They never had no children, and when he was killed in a railway accident, she trimmed up that parrot's cage with crepe, and now... Mrs. Tenere, with increasing solemnity, chewed her calamus root. Now she's been and bought one of them automobiles and runs it herself like you'd run your sewing machine, just as shameless. Both of the ladies glared condemnation at the distant blue feather. Mrs. Tenere continued, Hetty Cronin's worth a dozen of her. When I think of that there bird going on this excursion, and Hetty Crony staying home because she's too poor, I get nasty, Mrs. Bean, yes I do. Don't your cousin Hetty live over to Chadwick's Harbor? inquired Mrs. Bean. And don't this boat ride stop there to take on more folks? Mrs. Tenere, acknowledging that these things were so, uncorked the small bottle of cologne and poured a little of it on the handkerchief embroidered in black forget-me-nots. She handed the bottle to Mrs. Bean, then took three polite sniffs and closed her eyes. The two ladies sat silent for a moment. They experienced a detachment of luxurious abandon filled with the poetry of the steamboat salon. Psychically, they were affected as by ecclesiasticism. The perfume of the cologne and the throb of the engines swept them in a sense of aesthetic reverie, the thrill of travel and the atmosphere of elegance. Moreover, the story of the Hutch money and the Hutch heirs had in some undefined way affiliated the two. At last, by tactic consent, they rose, went out on deck, and, holding their reticules tight, walked majestically up and down. When they passed Mrs. Tuttle's blue feathers and the gold parrot cage, they smiled meaningfully and looked at each other. As the fall of Rome approached Chadwick's landing, more intimate groups formed. The air was mild, the sun warm and inviting, and the water an obvious and understandable blue. Some serious-minded excursionists sat well forward on their camp stools discussing deep topics over half-skinned bananas. "'Give me the vote,' the lady in the purple raincoat was saying. "'Give me the vote, and I undertake to close up every rum hole in God's world.' A mild-mannered youth with no chin upon hearing this edged away. He went to the stern, looking down for a long time upon the white path of foam left in the wake of the fall of Rome, and taking a harmonica from his waistcoat pocket, began to play, Darling, I am growing old. This tune, played with emotional throbbings managed by spasmodic movements of the hand over the sides of the mouth, seemed to convey anything but age to Miss Mealer, the girl who was so refined. She also sat alone in the stern, also staring down at the white water. As the wailings of the harmonica ceased, she put up a thin hand and furtively controlled some waving strands of hair. Suddenly, with scarlet face, the mild-mannered youth moved up his camp stool to her side. They're talking about closing up the rum holes, he indicated the group dominated by the lady in the purple raincoat. They don't know what they're talking about. Some rum holes is real refined and tasty. Some of them got gramophones you can hear for nothing. Is that so? responded the refined Miss Mealer. She smoothed her gloves. She opened her mesh bag and took out an intensely perfumed handkerchief. The mild-mannered youth put his harmonica in his pocket and warmed up to the topic. Many's the time I sat into the salon listening to that lady that sings high up, higher than any piano can go. I've sat and listened till I don't know where I was sitting. Of course I had to buy a drink, you understand, but I couldn't have sat. And they call that vice, remarked Miss Mealer with languid criticism. The mild-mannered youth looked at her gratefully. The light of reason and philosophy seemed to him to shine in her eyes. 
You've got a piano to your house, he said boldly. Can you, um, play classic pieces? Can you play, um, Asleep on the Deep? In another group where substantial sandwiches were being eaten, the main theme was religion and psychic phenomena with a strong leaning towards deathbed experiences. And then my sister's mother-in-law, she sat up and she says, where am I, she says, like she was in a store or something, and told how she seen all white before her eyes and all like gentlemen in high silk hats walking around. There were sighs of comprehension, gasps of dolorous interest. The same with my Christopher. Just like my aunt's stepsister afore she went, Mrs. Tuttle did not favor the grave character of this symposia. With the assured manner peculiar to her, she swept into such circles bearing a round box of candy, upon which was tied a large bow of satin ribbon of a convivial shade of heliotrope. Opening this box, she handed it about, commanding, Help yourself. At first it was considered refined to refuse. One or two excursionists, awed by the superfluity of the heliotrope ribbon, said feebly, Don't rob yourself. But Mrs. Tuttle met this restraint with practice raillery. What are you afraid of? It ain't poisoned. I got more where this come from. She turned to the younger people. Come one, come all. It's French mixed. Meanwhile, Mrs. Bean and Mrs. Tenere, still aloof and enigmatic, paced the deck. Mrs. Tuttle, blue feathers streaming, teetered on her high heels in their direction. Again, she proffered the box. One of the cynical youths with the ivory-headed canes was following her, demanding that the parrot be fed a caramel. Once more, the sky-blue figure bent over the ornate cage. Then little Mrs. Bean looked at Mrs. Tenere with a gesture of utter repudiation. Ain't she terrible? As the steamboat approached the wharf and the dwarf pines and yellow sandbanks of Chadwick's Landing, a whispered consultation between these two ladies resulted in one desperate attempt to probe the heart of Mabel Hutch that was. Drawing camp stools up near the vicinity of the parrot's cage, they began with what might, to the, a suspicious nature, have seemed rather pointed speculation, to wonder who might or might not be at the wharf when the fall of Rome got in. Once more, the bottle of cologne was produced, and handkerchiefs genteelly dampened. Mrs. Bean, taking off her green glasses, polished them and held them up to the light, explaining, This here sea air makes them all of a muck. Suddenly, she leaned over to Mrs. Tuttle with an air of sympathetic interest. I suppose, uh, your sister Hetty will be coming on board when we get to Chadwick's Landing, her and her husband. Mrs. Tuttle fidgeted. She covered Romeo's cage with a curious arrangement like an altar cloth on which gay embroidered parakeets of all colors were supposed to give Romeo, when lonely, a feeling of congenial companionship. Mrs. Bean, thus evaded, screwed up her eyes tight, then opened them wide at Mrs. Tenere, who sat rigid, her gaze riveted upon far-off horizons, humming between long sighs a favorite hymn. Finally, however, the last-named lady leaned past Mrs. Bean and touched Mrs. Tuttle's silken knee, volunteering, "'Your sister Hetty likes the water, I know. You remember them days, Mrs. Tuttle, when we all went bathing together down to old Chadwick's harbor afore they built the new wharf.' Mrs. Tenere continued reminiscently. You remember them old dresses we wore, no classy bathing suits then, but my, the mornings used to smell good. That path to the shore was all wild roses, and we used to find blueberries in them woods. Us girls were always teased and heady. Her bathing dress was white muslin, and when it was wet, it stuck to her all over. She showed through, my, how we laughed. But yet for all, concluded Mrs. Tenere sentimentally, she looked lovely just like a little wet angel. Mrs. Tuttle carefully smoothed her blue mitts, observing nervously, funny how Mrs. Tenere could remember so far back. Is Hetty your sister by rights? Suavely inquired Mrs. Bean, or only by your pa's second marriage, as it were. The owner of the overestimated parrot roused herself. By rights, she admitted indifferently, I don't see much of her. She married beneath her. The tip of Mrs. Tenere's nose, either from cologne inhalings or sunburn, grew suddenly scarlet. However, she still regarded the far-off horizons and repeated the last stanza of her hymn, which stanza, sung with much quavering and sighing, was a statement to the effect that Mrs. Tenere would cling to the old rugged cross. Suddenly, however, she remarked to the surrounding summer air, Hen Crony is my second cousin on the mother's side. Some thought he was pretty smart until troubles come and his wife was done out of her rights. The shaft, carefully aimed, went straight into Mrs. Tuttle's blue bosom and stuck there. 
Her eyes, not over-intelligent, turned once in her complacent face, then with an air of grandiose detachment she occupied herself with the ends of her sky-blue automobile veil. "'I'll have to fix this different,' she remarked unconcernedly, "'or else my waves will come out. Well, I presume we'll soon be there. I better go downstairs and primp up some.' The high heels clattered away. Mrs. Bean fixed a long look of horror on Mrs. Tenere, who silently turned her eyes to the heaven. As the fall of Rome churned its way up to the sunny wharf of Chadwick's Landing, the group already on the excursion bristled with excitement. Children were prepared to meet indulgent grandparents, lovers their sweethearts, and married couples old school friends they had not seen for years. From time to time, these admonished their offspring. Hypatia Smith, you're dragging your pink sash. Leave mummer fix it. There now, don't you dare set down so grammar can see you looking good. Lionel Jones, you throw that old popcorn overboard. Do you want to eat it after you've had it on the floor? Does your stomach hurt you, dear? Well, here, don't cry. Mama will give you another crueler. With much shouting of jocular advice from the male passengers, the fall of Rome was warped into Chadwick's landing, and the waiting groups came aboard. As they streamed on, bearing bundles and boxes and all the impedimenta of excursions, those already on board congregated on the after deck to distinguish familiar faces. A few persons had come down to the landing merely to look upon the embarkation. These, not going themselves on the excursion, maintained an air of benevolent superiority that could not conceal vivid curiosity. Among them eagerly scanning the faces on deck was a very small, thin woman, clad in a gingham dress, on her head a battered straw hat of accentuated bygone mode, and an empty provision basket swinging on her arm. Mrs. Tenerake, peering down on her through smoked glasses, suddenly started violently, "'My sakes!' she ejaculated. "'My sakes!' Then, as the dramatic significance of the thing gripped her, "'My, my, my! Ain't that terrible!' Solemnly, with prunella portentousness, Mrs. Tenere stole back of the other passengers leaning over the rail up to Mrs. Bean, who looked at her animatedly, exclaiming, "'They've got a new schoolhouse. I can just see the copula. There's some changes since I was here.' They tell me there's a flag sidewalk in front of the Methodist Church, and that young Baxter, the express agent, has grown a mustache and has got married. Mrs. Tenere did not answer. She laid a compelling hand on Mrs. Bean's shoulder and turned her so that she looked straight at the small group of homestairs down on the wharf. She pointed a sepulchre finger. That there in the brown with the basket is Hetty Crony, own sister to Mrs. Josiah Tuttle. Mrs. Bean clutched her reticule and leaned over the rail, gasping with interest. You don't say, that's her? My, my, my. In solemn silence, the two regarded the little brown woman so unconscious of their gaze. By the piteous wizened face, screwed up in the sunlight, by the faded hair, nutcracker jaws, and hollow eyes, they utterly condemned Mrs. Tuttle, who, blue feathers floating, was also absorbed in watching the stream of embarking excursionists. Mrs. Tenere, after a whispered consultation with Mrs. Bean, went up and nudged her. Without ceremony, she pointed. Your sister's down there on the wharf, she announced flatly. Come on over where we are and you can see her. Frivolous Mrs. Tuttle turned and encountered a pair of eyes, steely in their determination, readjusting the gold cage more comfortably on its camp stool and murmuring a blessing on the hook-beak occupant, the azure lady tripped off in the wake of her flat-heeled friend. Meanwhile, Mr. Tenere, standing well aft, was calling cheerfully down to the little figure on the wharf. Next summer, you must get your nerve up and come along. Excursionists is all the rage now. My wife's took in four already. But little Mrs. Crony did not answer. Shading her eyes from the sun glare, she was establishing recognizance with her cerulean relative who, waving a careless, blue-mitted hand, called down in girlish greeting. Hey, yo, Hetty! How's Crony? Why ain't you to the excursion? The little woman on the wharf was seen to win slightly. She shifted her brown basket to the other arm, ignoring the second question. Oh, Crony's good. Only he's low-spirited. Seems as though he couldn't get no work. Same old crooked stick, hey? Mrs. Tuttle clawed down facetiously. Mrs. Bean and Mrs. Tenere stole horrified glances at each other. One planted a cotton-gloved hand over an opening mouth, but little Mrs. Crony, standing alone on the pier, was equal to the occasion. She shook out a small and spotless handkerchief, blowing her nose with elegant deliberation before she replied. 
Well, I don't know as he needs to work all the time. Crony is peculiar, you know. He's one of them that is high-toned and nifty with money. He ain't like some, clutching onto every penny. By degrees, other excursionists, leaning over the railing, began to catch at something spicy in the situation of these two sisters brought face to face. At Mrs. Crony's sally, one of the funny men guffawed at his approval. Groups of excursionists explained to each other that that lady down there, her on the wharf, in brown, was the own sister of Mrs. Josiah Tuttle. The whistle of the fall of Rome now sounded for all aboard. It was a dramatic moment, the possibilities of which suddenly gripped Mrs. Tenere. She clasped her hands in effortless agony. This lady, as she afterward related to Mrs. Bean, felt mean. She could see in her mind's eye, she said, how it all looked to Hetty Crony, the fall of Rome with its opulent, leisurely class of excursionists, steaming away from her lonely little figure on the wharf, while Mabel Tuttle, selfish devourer of the hutch's substance and heir to everything, would still be handing around her boxes of French mixed and talking baby talk to that there bird. At that moment, Mrs. Tenere's mind, dwelling upon the golden cage and its overestimated occupant, became a mere boiling of savage desire. Suddenly, the line of grim resolution hardened on her face. This one, one that the Tenere children invariably connected with the switch hanging behind the kitchen door, Mr. Tenere also knew well. Seeing it now, he hastened to his wife. What's the matter, mother? Seasick? Here, I'll get you a lemon. Mrs. Tenere, jaw set, eyes rolling, was able to intimate that she needed no lemon, but she drew her husband mysteriously aside. She fixed him with a foreboding stare. She said it was a wonder the Lord didn't sink the boat. Then she rapidly sketched the tragedy. Mrs. Tuttle serene and pampered on the deck, and Hetty Crony desolate on the wharf. She pronounced verdict. It's terrible, that's what it is. Mr. Tenere, with great sagacity, said he'd like to show Mabel Tuttle her place. Then he nudged his wife and chuckled admiringly. But yet, for all, Hetty's got her tongue in her head yet. Say, ain't she a little stinger? Soto voce... Mr. Tenere related to his spouse how Mabel Tuttle was bragging about her brick house and her shower bath and her automobile and her hired girl, and how she drove herself and that there bird down to Boston and back. Hetty, she just stands there just as easy and hollers back that Crony has bought a gramophone and how they sets by it day and night listening and how it's son and daughter to them. Then she calls up to Mabel Tuttle, I should think you'd be afraid of meddling with them automobiles. Your time of life. Mr. Tenere choked over his own rendition of this audacity, and his wife sniffed hopelessly. They ain't got no gramophone. Her with that face and hat? Crony don't make nut. They too could live on what that blue silk quilt feeds that stinking parrot. But Mr. Tenere chuckled again. He seemed to be possessed with the humor of some delightful secret. Looking carefully around him and seeing everyone absorbed in other things, he leaned closer to his wife. She's liable to lose that bird, he whispered. Them young fellows with the cane, they're full of their devilment. Well, they wanted I shouldn't say nothing, and I ain't say nothing, only... Fat Mr. Tenere, pale eyes rolling in merriment, pointed to the camp stool where once the parrot's cage had rested, and where now no parrot cage was to be seen. As far as I can see, he nudged his wife again. That bird's liable to get left ashore. In a moment, Mrs. Tenere received this news solidly. Then a look of comprehension flashed across her face. What are you talking about, Henry? She demanded. Say, ain't you never got grown up? Where's Monda Bean? Having located Mrs. Bean, the two ladies indulged in a rapid, whispered conversation. Upon certain revelations made by Mrs. Bean, Mrs. Tenere turned and laid commands upon her husband. Look here, she said, that what you told me is true, them young fellows. She fixed Mr. Tenere with blue glass significant eyes, adding sotto voce, you keep Mabel Tuttle busy. Fat Mr. Tenere, chuckling anew, withdrew to the after rail where the Azura lady still stood, chained as it were in a sort of stupor induced by the incisive thrusts of the forlorn little woman on the wharf. He joined in the conversation. So you got a gramophone, eh? He called down kindly. Say, that's nice, ain't it? That's company for you and crony. He appealed to Mrs. Tuttle in her supposed part of interested relative. Keeps him from getting lonesome and all, he explained. That lady, looking a pointed unbelief, could not, 
with the other excursionists watching, but follow his lead. Why, uh, y yes, that's real nice, she agreed with all the patronage of a wealthy relative. Little Mrs. Crony's eyes glittered. The steamboat's hands had begun lifting the hawsers from the wharf piles, and her time was short. She was not going to be pitied by the opulent persons on the excursion. Getting, as it were, into her stride, she took a bolder line of imagery. And the telephone... Looking up at Mr. Tenere, I've got friends in Quayog Junction and Russell Center. We're talking sometimes till nine o'clock at night. I can pick up jelly recipes and dress patterns just so easy. But Mrs. Tuttle now looked open credulity. She turned to such excursionists as stood by and registered empathic denial. Uh-huh, she called down in apparent acceptance of these lurid statements, at the same time remarking boldly to Mr. Tenere, who had placed himself at her side, she ain't got no telephone. At this moment, something seemed to occur to little Mrs. Crony. As she gave a parting, defiant scrutiny to her opulent sister, her black eyes snapped in hollow reminiscence, and she called out, Say, how's your parrot? How's your beau, Romeo? At this, understood to be a parting shot, the crowd strung along the rail of the fall of Rome, burst into a appreciative titter. Mrs. Tuttle, reddening, made no answer, but Mr. Tenere, standing by and knowing what he knew, seized this opportunity to call it down vociferously. Oh, he's good, Romeo is, but your sister's had him to the excursion, and he's got just a little seasick coming over. Mrs. Tuttle, your sister, is going to leave him with you till she can come and take him home, by land, you know, in her automobile. She's coming to get you, too, for a visit, you know. There was an effect almost as of panic on the fall of Rome. Not only did the big whistle for all aboard blow, but someone's new hat went overboard, and while everyone crowded to one side to see it rescued, it was not discovered that Romeo's cage had disappeared. In the confusion of a band of desperados composed of the entire group of cynical men with ivory headed canes, seized upon an object covered with something like an altar cloth, and ran down the gangplank with it. Going in a body to little Mrs. Crony, these young men deposited a glittering burden, the gold parrot cage with the green bird sitting within, in her surprised and gratified embrace. Like flashes, these agile young men jumped back upon the deck of the Fall of Rome just before the space between the wharf and deck became too wide to jump. Meanwhile, on the upper deck, before the petrified Mrs. Tuttle could open her mouth, Mr. Tenere shouted instructions. Your sister wants you to keep him, he roared, till she comes over to see you in her automobile to fetch him and get you for a visit. Suddenly, the entire crowd of excursionists on the after deck of the Fall of Rome gave a rousing cheer. The gratified young men with the ivory-headed canes suddenly saw themselves in the age of chivalry and burst into ragtime rapture. The excursion, a mass of waving flags and hats and automobile veils, made enthusiastic adieu to one faded little figure on the wharf, who, proud and happy, gently waved back a gleaming parrot cage. It was Mr. Tenere, dexterous in all such matters, that caught at a drooping cerulean form as it toppled over. I know she'd faint, the pale-eyed gentleman chuckled. He manfully held his burden until Mrs. Tenere and Mrs. Bean relieved him. These ladies practiced in awe smelling bottle and cologne soothings, applied also verbal comfort. Them young fellows, they explained to Mrs. Tuttle, is full of their devilment, and you can't never tell what they'll do next. But ain't it lucky, Mrs. Tuttle, that it's your own sister has charge of that bird? When at last a pale and interesting lady in blue appeared feebly on deck, wiping away recurrent tears. She was received with the most perfect sympathy, tempered with congratulations. There may have been a few winks and one or two nods of understanding, which she did not see, but Mrs. Tuttle herself was petted and soothed like a queen of the realm, only, to her mind, was brought something of obligation, the eternal obligation of those who greatly possess, for every excursionist said, "'My, yes, no need to worry.' Your sister would take care of that bird like he was one of her own, and then you can go over in your automobile to get him, and when you fetch him, you can take her home with you for a visit. 